Lilia is a professor, professor at the University of, uh, of Minnesota. She had the postdoctoral positions at uh, Cambridge uh, and then in the uh, uh, University of Victoria. Uh, her main uh, research interests are uh, dark matter halos, cosmology, and uh, uh, structure formation. Today she, uh, she will uh, show us, us how to derive uh, dark matter uh, halos properties by, uh, uh, from first principles. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so my collaborators in this work uh, are mostly Jens York, who is at a dark cosmology center in, in Copenhagen. Um, Radek is, uh, is a postdoc there, and Eric Barnes is an um, ex-postdoc of mine, who is now moved on. So um, we know that most galaxies and dark matter halos appear to be smooth meaning that they have very few signatures left over of their formation process. Um, and so what we conclude is that these, these objects are pretty much relaxed, and they've lost the memory of the initial conditions. Um, and in there, the, at least the ones that are not undergoing concurrent merger, um, the rest of the objects, um, their steady state configuration is described by properties that appear to be universal, at least uh, among uh, dark matter halos, and also between galaxies as well. So these are some of the puzzles that one needs to, one would like to solve. And one can ask two questions um, relating to these observations. One is how do galaxies and dark matter halos relax? What, is the, what are the dynamical processes that lead up to that configuration? And the other one is how to calculate the final steady state configuration of um, uh, dark matter halos and galaxies as well. And in this talk, I'll concentrate on, um, on dark matter halos, but the same thing that I'll be talking about will apply to large collections of stars as well, as we will see. Um, okay, so I will talk mostly, I'll concentrate mostly on this, um, on this question, and I will not say much about this, except for the next two slides as a lead-in to the following discussion. Um, so, Galaxies and dark matter halos are relaxed. For gravitating systems, we can think of two general types of relaxation processes that are available to them. Um, one is to body collisional relaxation, and the other one is collisional. So in, in a collisional relaxation, you have um, a bunch of particles, dark matter particles, and if you concentrate on one and follow its path, it's going to wiggle through other particles and be deflected by, by nearby neighbors and also a little bit by the far neighbors as well. And you can do a calculation as to how long this takes and you will see that uh, a time scale for two body relaxation really depends on the number of particles that are participating in this process. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes something like n over ln n. And if you do the actual numbers, you will see that for a typical galaxy with a typical number of stars in it, that relaxation time is about 10 to the 12 years, which is longer than the Hubble time. If you think of um, dark matter halos and you know how many dark matter particles there are roughly, then the time scale becomes ridiculously large, uh, much, much longer than the Hubble time. So just from the time scale con uh, considerations alone, you know that two-body relaxation is not the relaxation process that brought you to a smooth um, appearance of galaxies and, and dark matter halos. We have to be working with something else. And the other option for self gravitating systems and other types of systems um, is collisionless relaxation. And here, the details of how that happens are a little murky. We don't have a good theory for, for that. But you can calculate approximate order of magnitude um, time scale for that. And this relaxation takes place on dynamical time scales which depends only on the density of, uh, of the region that you're considering. And so that time scale is going to be the same for stars and uh, dark matter particles in a halo, which is a good thing. And, and uh, that time scale is shorter than the Hubble time. So this is good. That means we can accomplish um, a smooth appearance of galaxies and dark matter halos in a time scale that we need to do so. Um, okay, so let me say a few more words about these two. The, the, um, you can say the physical description of these two processes involved. 
two-body relaxation, if you think of the potential, the gravitational potential that the system that undergoes this relaxation has, it, it will look bumpy. And the bumps, or the clumps, the bumps is a better word actually, the bumps will be on the scales of in the particle separation. So on the time on the time on the length scale of particle separation. And because of that, because the potential is not smooth, um, even when the system reaches steady state configuration, when it has, as a macroscopic system, has stopped evolving and looks the same, even at that time, the particle's energies are going to change due to encounters. They're not going to stay the same. Collisionless relaxation is different in that regard. If you look at the potential of a collisionless system, um, the number of particles is, it has is so many that the potential will smooth. There can be variations, but they would be on scale much larger than the separation between particles. So the perturbations of the potential would not be reflecting the presence of individual particles. Um, and because of this, the flow of particles in phase space is smooth. And that leads us to uh, the well-known collisionless Boltzmann equation that says that um, the phase space flow is incompressible for a collisionless system. Um, now, if we go back to the period when um, these systems were relaxing, during relaxation, the potential changes. Um, it can change in, um, in a spherical symmetric fashion or it can change in non-spherical symmetric fashion. But in, in this case, it changes. And because of that, the energies of individual particles would change as they ride this global potential. Now, once the system has arrived at its steady state configuration and looks mac macroscopically unchanging, then the particle's energies do not change anymore. Because particle en energies only change because the potential changes. And if it doesn't, particle en energies don't change. And so this provides a contrasting picture between two types of relaxation. So in this talk, we'll mostly deal with collisionless relaxation. And I'll say a little bit more about two-body relaxation later on. Okay, so um, the, um, the people have started doing end-body simulations to uh, predict what the final steady state of collisionless systems is going to be a long time ago. And here I have a result by, um, by people of this audience that came out in 1991. And uh, the basic qualitative description of um, of that result is the same as what we have today. Um, so these are some of the results from uh, from NFW uh, group, and, uh, and and so this is a half density on both vertical axes and log radius on the horizontal axis, and this is the shape of the profile for um, about ten years or so, ending a few years prior to today. The best description was considered to be the NFW profile due to Navarro, Frank, and White that has a certain parametric formula fitting function to go with it. But these days, it's actually realized that a much better description to the results of embodied simulations um, is the Inasso profile, which has a shape parameter called alpha. Um, this is the same functional form as Sersich or Dewopolor's profile. Only instead of reading R as a two-dimensional projected R, you read it as a three-dimensional R. But the functional mathematical form of that formula is the same, and it has that single shape parameter, which, um, for example, for the is, is four. But here it is variable. So what we have plotted here is density multiplied by radius squared, um, so that you can see deviations from a parallel much more easy. Um, where the, this curve is flat, that's where the density is, goes as r to the minus 2, and it is shallower and steeper outside. And so here we have residuals from three different types of pits, in Asto, in FW, and more 99. And you can see that in Asto gives uh, definitely smaller residuals compared to either of these two functions. Um, and just for completeness, this is the log of the velocity dispersion is as a, a function of radius, and it peaks at some intermediate <laughs> radius and declines towards the center and outside. And what I have here is another way to uh, depict the density distribution. So this is a um, minus of the double logarithmic slope of, um, of the density profile. So 
this is two is the quote unquote isothermal slope, and it gets shallow inside and, and, and steeper outside. And these again are the residuals. So uh, an osteo profile in this in these coordinates looks like a straight line. And you can see that the simulations follow the straight line much better than they do either the NFW or the M uh, more 99 profile. Okay, so by this time in, in our history, um, and body simulations have uh, given us a very good, precise description of the physical properties of dark matter halos. Not just the density distribution, but also velocity distribution and even higher moments of the velocity um, distribution, uh, distribution profile, if you want to know that. So, um, now we know the properties of dark matter halos. But why do halos have these properties? And this is the basic question that motivates this work. Okay, how to calculate the properties of the final steady state configuration of collisionless systems? Here I describe sort of two um, general approaches that people have taken in the past. Um, and I'll start with the phenomenological. So this would be, and um, the, the papers I'm quoting here are the most recent ones. There is really history of these papers going back to the 1960s, but the list is too long. So these are some of the more important, more recent ones. And what these papers are attempting to do is look at the results of embodied simulation, such as the density profile, and try to phenomenologically argue uh, why the profiles ended up being what they are. Okay, another type of approach, uh, quite different, uh, was started, um, or for many people, the, the first paper of you note know, would be Lyndon Bell, but uh, behind the Iron Curtain, it would have been um, Agarone of 1957, a whole 10 years before Lyndon Bell. And this is the paper uh, where uh, Lyndon Bell introduced violent relaxation. Um, but the basic principle um, is that you, you think of um, the galaxies with dark matter halos as consisting of really many, many, many particles. And in that situation, you don't care about what each particle does, what you care about the statistical properties of the system. So then the natural route to go would be uh, statistical events. And that's what Lyndon Bell uh, and other articles suggested. Um, right, the stack net approach. And you would then postulate that the final steady state configuration of these systems um, is some sort of a maximum entropy or, or more generally maximum likelihood state. And that's how we would arrive at that, at that configuration. Um, uh, Lyndon Bell's results have a, a number of problems and because of that, uh, research went on for decades following that and many people have tried to modify Lyndon Bell's result and his approach to, um, to make it more compatible with observations so remove observational problems without comparison with the observations and also a few theoretical um, issues that were not quite settled by the Lyndon Bell work. So this would be these papers here. Um, what, uh, or what I'm going to do first is to give you a little bit more of a context for Lyndon Bell paper, his maximum entropy approach. So since it is statistical mechanics, uh, he um, thought that it might be good to have um, some gravitating collisional systems fit into the existing framework for statistical mechanics. And from classical step back, we know that there are three types of distribution functions. And note that all of these three existing ones deal with short range forces. Gravity is very different that way. Gravity is a long range force, which is what makes it very difficult to, to analyze. So anyway, so here are the three families that we are familiar with. And Lyndon Bell argued this way. Um, he knew that he had to incorporate the collisionless nature of um, these systems into, into his approach. And the way he decided to do that is the following. Um, remember, um, a few slides back, uh, we said that the collisionless Boltzmann equation tells us that uh, the flow in phase space is incompressible. And what that means is that if you have two uh, parcels of phase space, you cannot just superimpose them on one another. Uh, they have to be they have to be kept apart, and so this is a kind of an exclusion pr principle. Exclusion principle 
of the type that we have in the Fermi Dirac distribution. So this is what Wendell Bell went with. And of course, the, the particles, this is gravity, so the particles are obviously classical, not, uh, not quantum mechanical particles. So then uh, his description would fit neatly into this empty box that you have right here, right? Okay, so he went on with the, um, with the procedure and the resulting profiles that he got after, um, well, at the end of his analysis are isothermal spheres, not necessarily singular isothermal spheres, but isothermal spheres. And most of these have a flat density core. Unfortunately, isothermal spheres do not fit either galaxies or n-body simulations. And this is on the observational side. On the theoretical side, they have an infinite mass, even though the maximum entropy analysis that um, led to deriving them explicitly asked for a finite um, mass and energy system. So there are a few problems with that. Um, what we are doing is, is somewhat different and um, well, one could say significantly different from, from Lyndon Bell. And um, I'll describe it to stages. First, I'll tell you what it is that we do. So we start with Maxwell Boltzmann counting. Um, so there is classical particles, and um, there's no exclusion principle. And I will come back to that in a second. And you would write down the density of states, as you usually do, and you would maximize that subject to two constraints, again, as a, as a standard to do. Uh, so there are two Lagrange multipliers that go here, one that goes with the uh, fixed total mass and fixed total energy. Um, except that one of the things that we do that standard analysis doesn't is that we don't use the Stirling approximation. It is a standard to use this approximation. <coughs> and um, in terms of the occupation numbers, so here I have n on the horizontal axis, it goes from 0 to 10. Um, Stirling approximation, so if you do not use the approximation, then you would be calculating a straight line in, this, um, in these axes. Strolling approximation gives you this, so it really breaks down at low occupation numbers. The approximation that we use is still an approximation, but it's much, much better uh, than the strolling one, and especially it does a very good job at low occupation numbers. And um, the, the, treating low occupation numbers correctly um, seems to be an important thing for self-gravitating systems, not just uh, collisionless that I'll describe, but also collisional, and that I won't have time to talk about, but you can ask me later. Um, and I should say that we were definitely not the first ones to toss the Stirling approximation and use something better. Um, this goes back to um, many papers, one of them from StatMet literature, but most no more notably for astronomers, is it goes back to Matz in 96, who um, gave, the, gave the first theoretical um, calculation of the K1966 distribution function that applies to global clusters. Uh, King motivated his distribution function, but he, he did not derive from first principles maths in it. Okay, so small occupation numbers, fine. Um, then the procedure that we follow is very similar to what the standard would be. And what we get is this function, it's an exponential that you would recognize from Axel Boltzmann. This, um, and, and then there's this minus one. And that minus one comes from um, not using strobing approximation but doing better than that. Okay, uh, these quantities are scaled. So phi is um, the depth of the potential. It's a dimension less depth of the potential and it's a single shape parameter for our models. E is the scaled energy which is combined kinetic and potential energy for these particles. And, and so now we have this thing on the left hand side. Standardly, you would interpret that um, as, the, um, as the phase space density. Right. Um, we argue that for collisionless um, self gravitating systems, this should be interpreted as the um, number of particles, distribution of particles and energy, as opposed to phase space. So it is basically, this is basically the distribution function times the density of states. So this is what we have here. And this is, um, this is our final prediction. It's very simple. Um, we call it dark x. And like I said, it has one shape parameter. Wait, wait, are these energies just defined in positive and negative? Just, 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 
Um, so this is positive, and this is positive too. Yeah. Um, this is this is. Yes, correct. The K model has exactly the same thing, but this is the distribution function. This is f of e. So if you if this is f of e, that's the functional form. N of e is the energy distribution of, so it's just the distribution of particles and energy, as opposed to the density in phase space of a given energy. This is so it, it's a much from say experimental point of view, it's a much simpler quantity to get because you just calculate energies of each particle and then you do a histogram of them, and that's what this is. And in fact, here here is that that histogram. Um, this is our scaled energy, so these are the most bound particles. This, um, this would be the at escape velocity, and I've displaced these a little bit so that um, you can <coughs> see that they're, I mean, if I were to superimpose them, all these lines would, would be one. So the single shape parameter tells you where to cut off this function, and this is obviously the exponential part, and this is due to the minus one part of it. So to recap, uh, two modifications to standard Maxwell Boltzmann. And these modifications are not random. Um, the not using the Stirling approximation um, is, is necessary, we would argue, for, uh, for gravity for systems where the force is gravity. And um, interpreting this as number in energy space as opposed to the distribution function um, is encapsulates the collisionless nature of the systems and I'll tell you how. Um, so again, going back to what a collisionless system is, in the steady state, the energy is a fixed property of a given particle. It's actually an energy and angular momentum. The two quantities, uh, once a, a collisionless system is in steady state, those two numbers do not change. So it suggests uh, that these two properties are really the, the more fundamental space um, in which to work with, as opposed to um, position and momentum. Uh, breaking up a collisionless orbit into position and momentum is a little bit like taking a sphere and thinking of it in Cartesian coordinates. It's just not as natural. Another thing I can um, give you an example of, of why energy and angular momentum are the thing to use is if you think of the Schwarzschild orbit superposition method, which is often used in, in, in dynamics, there a system is, um, the building block of a system is, is an orbit. And an orbit lives in, in L and E space, energy and angular momentum space. So we use the same um, arguments to motivate using E as the fundamental space in which we work with. Okay, so this is our prediction. And now we would like to compare it to whatever is out there to be compared with. And the first thing we compare it to is to a set of simulations, um, in, and body simulations, that uh, came from sort of the progenitor of the CLUES project from that group. And um, so this is the magenta line is dark X, and the shaded region is, is from simulations. The viral radius is somewhere here. That means all these particles are not bound to the halo, and it, one shouldn't be looking at that. So it, this is the viral line. And this is a collection of 36 halos, hence there's a little bit of width to this, to this line. So um, in, this, in this representation, our prediction matches the embodied simulations really well. And like I said, there's one adjustable parameter, which is the dimensionless depth of the potential, and that was fitted. That was the only thing. And it seems that um, n-body simulations of galaxies and clusters of galaxies have a relatively narrow range of uh, final parameters, somewhere between four and five. Okay. Now, um, so this is comparison in energy. We can also do comparison in density profiles. And before we do that, I, um, I have to show you what our prediction dark x looks like in terms of density versus radius. Um, so here I have the log, rate, the log density log radius, and the red line here and here too is the NFW profile just for comparison. So what you see is that 
our density profiles have oscillations at small radii. Why certain energy distributions give rise to oscillating density profiles and others don't, we haven't figured that out yet. But for example, Plummer profiles of n equals uh, close to 5, not quite 5, so near Plummer profiles have also um, oscillating density profiles. We don't know, nobody knows why. But these oscillations happen at very small radii and they involve very little mass and in any realistic situation, this is always a completely spherical symmetric system. In any realistic situation where you have any degree of asymmetry or any other imperfection, um, these oscillations will be, will be wiped out. Um, this is the double logarithmic slope of the density versus radius. Um, so they're normalized to go to this point. The you know, blue line is the Nasco profile for comparison, and there are two red lines. One is um, Hernquist and one is NFW. Okay, so this is just what they look like. If we compare them to uh, what we have in simulations, so this is the corresponding plot from um, Navarro and all, and these are the results of the simulations. And in that narrow range of final parameters, uh, the black lines here give the predictions of the dark X model. And they are pretty close to what the Inasta model gives you, which is what the, these authors have fitted to, to their profiles. So we would say it's a good fit to the density distribution of often body simulations. Definitely much better than NFW does. And this is another profile that was suggested by Stadel and Moore. So the energy distribution sort of requires an isotropic. Correct, yes. So, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. So we have uh, our model as a function of one, just energy. Um, and um, it's, so you can think of, you know, for an isotropic system, there's just one isolating integral of motion, and that's energy. And so uh, because we only have energy, these are only isotropic systems that we're dealing with. Is that nice? It's pretty good because, uh, it, well, pretty good for body simulation because the energy distribution actually is quite insensitive to anisotropy. Not so the distribution function, but the energy distribution is insensitive. So um, well, you can. What the density profile is in the is somewhat more sensitive. Not really. Well, but does NMD actually specify the dynamical state of the system? Like does. You can drive all the properties from that. Yes, you can. But you must be to make that. You need to make additional assumptions. I saw to be So you need to make an assumption about the coordinates. That it's, no, it's isotropic. But that's an assumption. It is an, and it is, well, it's not, uh, it's kind of um, built in. Our analysis is done for isotropic okay. systems. Yeah, right. So we have to have that assumption. Well, how about testing? Is there any concern with the outside of the lab? There are the triaxial too. Oh, absolutely. Real so, systems are triaxial. They do have an isotropy. Um, but what I'm saying is that, and that is actually, those are things that are to be um, done in the future work. Right now, it's um, mm -hmm. our analysis. Is I, I guess the, 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 your focus, the initial emphasis is on this. Region inside the scale radius, right? Uh, right. This and one. so in that region, how well does it be? And why yellow is an off isotropic? It's a triaxial, so it's not a piece of the yellow. So the triaxial all the way down. Yeah. Right. Oh, you don't so have more spherical as you go closer. There are two types of isotropy <laughs> there's velocity isotropy and the geometrical isotropy. And I'm talking, I'm talking about velocity isotropy. But yes, they're, they're not, uh, real systems are uh, non-isotropic in sort of in the geometrical sense, as well as velocity and isotropy sense, yes. Um, but velocity and isotropy would not make much of a difference in this plot. And in fact, these halos are, they're from simulations, so they would have both the triaxiality whatever degree shows up in simulations, 
as well as velocity and isotropy. And energy distribution is not much affected by that. Okay, so this is a comparison to n-body simulations. One can also do some comparison to um, real systems in the universe. So uh, Newman et al. did an analysis on um, seven relaxed galaxy clusters. And they cover three decades in radius. So it's a very radially extended analysis. And to do that, they combine stellar kinematics in the innermost region. This is for the central and brightest cluster galaxy. Um, strong lensing for the intermediate region and weak lensing for the outer radii. And this is density times r squared. And, and these are the seven individual profiles. Um, and I think the median is this gray line. And their conclusion from their paper is that the combined profile of these actual galaxy clusters is best represented by pure dark matter simulations. And so they have this dashed black line here as a DM only Phoenix <coughs> simulation. So um, if you do hydro simulations and try to fit them to this, they, they, they do not fit. But pure dark matter profiles do. And so what, what one can do, and this is this is preliminary analysis. This is this is not this is me superimposing two things on the transparency. Um, so I've shaded a little bit there uh, the Newman et al. cluster sample, which you can see is still see showing up here. And the black lines here are the dark X model. And you can see that they do follow, except for the very center, where the the stars of the BCG begin to dominate, they follow um, our prediction quite well in the, in the density distribution. And these are the shape parameters. So they mostly follow shape parameter around five. Um, a similar type of analysis was done with a different set of observed clusters, clusters by Ometso et al. They used four relaxed clusters. It's a completely different set from the seven that I showed before. Um, they use weak lensing, strong lensing, and magnification lensing to um, give us um, almost two decades in radius. And um, Veraldo, Silva, and all did a statistical analysis comparing different um, fitting functions and theoretical models, how they fit the observed clusters. And um, all the fitting functions do about the same. This is chi squared of something like 0 0.5, slightly less than 0 0.5 for most of these functions including an ASCO current twist, that L generalized in a W, Sersich, um, everything. And the theoretical models, dark X definitely does uh, considerably better than, than the other models that were pre uh, suggested. Our um, reduced chi squared is about 0.5 and the rest are 2 plus. So they conclude that dark X of the theoretical models definitely does the best. One can, so this is clusters clusters of galaxies. Um, one can also do a comparison with other types of structures in n-body simulations. So these are subhalos. These are not the main halos, but the subhalos taken from the query simulation. And this is um, a paper by Derek uh, Chiva et al. Uh, 2012. And um, so these, these were grouped into um, they did the fitting with Inasco, and um, they grouped them by the Inasco best fitting index in the three categories. They, one of the conclusions is that the NFW profile does not provide a good fit at all. The residuals, these are the residuals, they're just not good at all. They're reasonable for this set, but they're completely uh, not good for, for this set of subhalos. Inasco does much better across. And what I should point out, is, well, Inasta is a um, Inasta is a fitting function, uh, but dark X approximates Inasta pretty well, and actually for smaller shape parameters as well. And so, if you were to ask yourself what theoretical model would explain the density profiles of subhalos the answer would be our model dark X. Uh, because it, again, this fitting, we haven't done this fitting yet. This is high by eye. Uh, this is the, the purple is the best fitting in ASCO profile and the dark X, X 
with shape parameters one to three, so this is not not really fitting, but examples um, approximates these pretty well. So this is something that we will that analysis will do in the future. Okay. Okay, so now some, something different. All the systems that we talked about were collision-less systems. Um, admitted by everybody to be collision-less and nothing else. Then there's global clusters, which most people, including me, until a year and a half ago, would have said that they're collisional systems, very much so. Um, but I was, we were looking at um, some of the density surface brightness profiles. So I should say I'm making a switch here. Before I was talking about dark matter and maybe stars in elliptical. Um, now I'm switching to talking about surface brightness distribution in global clusters. So we're looking at stars and stars that don't number in 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, but something like 10 to the 5. So much smaller numbers. And that's why um, collisionless relaxation is um, apparently is, um, is a good way to go. But the surface brightness profiles, um, as I will show you, seem to be of global process, seem to benefit in general by, by dark X rather than the pink profiles. And this is some, some history for global clusters. Mm -hmm. These are fits. So here's one particular cluster, M3. And you can see up here, they have fit their surface brightness distributions with two King models. Here's one and here's two. So it's a superposition. So there's one shape parameter to go with each one of these things. Um, here, and, and it's a reasonable fit, but not as good as if you use 10 mass ranges with uh, 10 shape parameters. And then the fit is really good. Um, what we, and I'll show you many more, uh, what we do is take the data that was obtained um, by Noyola and Gephardt they have a sample of 38 clusters uh, that have surface brightness distributions of uh, almost three decades in radius. And we fit everything consistently with one King model and one dark X model. And um, I will show you, I'll show you the residuals in a second, but um, these are four examples of four clusters and in blue, right, residuals, the dark X is in blue, King is in black. And so in some cases, both do equally badly. In some cases, dark X does considerably better than a single parameter king. And I'm not going to show you all 38. Here are the residuals. These are dark X, these are king. And obviously, king residuals are considerably larger than, um, than what we have with a model that was originally designed to be collisionless. And what we are saying as a question mark, is it possible that uh, global clusters are more complicated than we originally thought. Obviously, some aspects of global clusters are collisional. You form binaries, they harden, um, there's mass segregation. All those things are the result of collisional uh, two-body relaxation. But maybe the global density distribution of these clusters are actually determined by collisionless processes. Because they are fit by the same function that fits uh, collision-less and body simulations. Any protests? Yes, I don't understand your thinking about the energy distribution of the Does it imply anything about the issue of collision-less? It seems to me, okay, so I think I understand what you wrote down the partition function. Yes. And then you try to maximize the uh, Right, the procedure is, is completely standard. Yes, we try. Yes, we try to um, extremize this function sum to do two constraints. So correct. Yes. And then they get the That's right. So where is the collisional collision? The collisional collision less is in interpreting this as the distribution of energy, as opposed to uh, distribution function in position momentum space, right? We took, this is a different uh, partition of state space. 
get different shape parameters for the normal density? Yes, we do. I don't have that here, but we have a much wider range of shape parameters. So, going back to your question, the collision lessness is in what basically what um, what was the state space that this counting was done, right? And it's not the standard um, position momentum space that. Um, that you standardly do these things in, but it is in, in energy. And energy and angular momentum, but these isotropic systems are just energy. That's where the collision lessness comes from. Okay, so let me put this in a, um, in a somewhat broader perspective and also with a little bit of a sense of History. Um, these are the three standard families, the statistical and mechanics families that we know from the courses and textbooks. Uh, Lyndon Bell um, was going to um, was envisioning that collisionless systems would fit into this this box, so that classical particles with the exclusion principle applied in phase space. Um, this does not seem to be the case both from observational and theoretical grounds, this is not, not the thing to do. So then uh, the next step that, that one would do is um, do not use the Stirling approximation. And now we're going to confine ourselves to gravity-only systems. So indistinguishable particles is, um, well, there are no quantum particles in gravity. So these two boxes become irrelevant. Um, if, you, um, if you redo um, the analysis, um, okay, let me back up. If you do Lyndon Bell's analysis without the Stirling approximation, you get something that I did not talk about here. But these are finite mass systems, so it circumvents one of the main problems that Lyndon Bell has, which is that the isothermal spheres are infinite. We reviewed that analysis without the Stirling approximation and got rid of the infinity problem. Um, and like I said before, um, this box the King profile and the maximum derivation would fit into this box. And this is using phase space. We are arguing that for collision-less systems, this is the correct energy and angular momentum space is the right way to go. And still, one should not use the Stirling approximation. Um, and if you're working in energy and angular momentum space, then the exclusion principle has no meaning at all because you can definitely have more than one particle uh, at the same energy and angular momentum. So all the three, these three boxes have become irrelevant, and the only box in this original scheme of things is the one that has classical particles with no exclusion principle, um, um, no strongly approximation, and this state space. And so this is where uh, then dark X fits into, into the scheme of things. And that brings me to my conclusions. Um, this is, uh, the, the model that I have described today is a first principles approach um, to model collisionless systems. Um, and this is how we did it and how it differs from the standard, standard approach. And I should emphasize that this is, um, this is the maximum likelihood approach. That means we are not saying anything about how the system evolved dynamically to get to where it is. It is really comparing the final states and asking yourself which one of these is most probable from the statistical point of view. Whichever dynamics brought it to that state, we are not able to answer that question using this analysis. So it's not derivable actually from the modified phase uh, space approach. Uh -huh. it's, it's not derivable. It's energy distribution is not reliable for the phase space approach. Correct. Yes. As in, if we started working in regular phase space, um, yeah, we, you cannot get this. Because by saying that's not the right um, state space to work in when you do your you know, resha ran random reshuffling of points, that's just not the right space to work in. We can, of course, derive the distribution function. Having obtained energy distribution, we can um, C 
see what the distribution function looks like if we include the density of states into that. But the primary result is in the, in the space of energy and high moment. Um, right, and um, as I showed you, um, X fits these things, even some of the results are preliminary. Um, the ones with the subhalos and um, relaxed clusters. So these two the results are preliminary. Right now it's chi by i, um, but I don't see how the actual analysis would do any worse than what chi by i does. And all these fits are done with one shape parameter. And so what I'm claiming is uh, the most important things, if you take out the stop, are the ones that I have in colors and underlined. That is a first principle model that fits um, observations of dark matter halos and you know, systems with one shape parameter. Oh, and this, well, that's future work. Uh, the main, on the theoretical side, the main thing to do is to extend that formalism to include the angular momentum. And the other one is to see how the dimensional shape parameter relates to the physical and dimensional properties of halos like mass, formation, history, environment, etc., etc. And I'll leave you with this. Thank you. Okay. So a few weeks ago, we had a talk here by Andrew Fonson. It sounded very similar to what you're saying. We had an email conversation with them, yeah. And if you didn't listen to me, you got the vacation of how it differs or not from, from both you and from the King Michelson and from, I mean, the he in his explanation, it's not very similar, you get a lot of infinities and you use more input the motion gate of E and L. So it seems like he went away. Is that a step or you think he's behind your first step or is it, is it different at all? Is it the same? It's, so he's working in, um, Position momentum phase space in the regular phase space, and he is uh, he is writing down entropy as PLNP directly. So he is he is assuming that um, that that is his starting point, right? So he's using the um, that definition of entropy, and he's working in a different state space compared to us. So th this is the beginning of their approach. Is it? Uh, but let, let me tell you. Yes, you can see them a little bit in '67. Um. Yes, he did partly. That's right. The the state space is definitely the same as what Lyndon Bell did. But they don't go. Um, yeah, they would have. Yes, you can say that they do something like this. They. Um, so it is very similar to Lyndon Bell in that regard. In this, in the sense that they're in the same state space and they do use the Stirling approximation. Yes, so that is the same. What he's doing differently from Lyndon Bell, but similar to, <coughs> Oops. yeah, there you go. So this is um, Fonson and Dominata. Right, so they, their approach is very similar to Lyndon Bell, except that they, um, in addition to energy, they introduce other functions that involve angular momentum. Which is your last night, you can get on E and L, right? what he already did. Um, he did it in a very different way. And also another thing is that the number of parameters that they use to fit a single system is something like three to four, as opposed to one for us. Because uh, introduction of uh, angular momentum, and it's actually, it's components of, there's a Z component and the total angular momentum. Um, and those come with three parameters to be adjusted. And he has, to fit an actual halo, one population of particles is not enough for that. It has to be at least two populations of particles. Because otherwise they have a deficit of uh, material at um, low angular momentum. So they have to introduce a second population to account for that. So I would argue that it's a more, um, more elaborate model to fit the same, um, the same systems. Um, so I was wondering, in the Vernal Sphere Zero paper, what we find is that with different subhalos, you use different alpha parameters for this NS 
rest of it. Um, so basically, you uh, you allow yourself an extra degree of freedom compared to a, an NMW. Um, it is interesting that you match that profile, but um, what I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is why do you have anything for the physical um, the physical reason for why different subtitles are uh, fitted by different alpha parameters? Because there's some idea that it might have to do with stripping of halos, and that then you know they might change their alpha parameter. I was wondering how in your scheme with your fitting parameter, um, this might tell you something. Um, at present, no. In the future, maybe. Right now, it is it is just it is just fitting. But yes, I, I know uh, that from that paper that some of the, the different shape parameters could be due to fitting. Like, sorry, due to stripping because they are living in a in a parent halo. Is that um, obviously also due to the order of possible things, right? Where the deviations were strongest in the what was the tidal radius? Oh. Not in all cases, though. Not in all cases. In well, some cases, the, the the tidal radius is actually um, you know somewhere here, and the surface brightness profile just keeps going right through that radius, not noticing it. There, I I cannot tell you the actual clusters on the top of my head, but but it was in the other parts that you were seeing the largest leverage, right? In the beds. Yeah. yeah. That's so where the biggest improvement. Yeah, I would argue here too. Yeah. I'd argue both. And the reason is that because, so this is going back to, um, well, a few years ago, including Noel and Gephardt paper, uh, people have, have been noticing that um, the central parts of global clusters don't have flat density cores like the King profile would predict. Some of them are kind of cuspy. And so uh, our one shape parameter takes care of the outer radii as well as having the ability to give you a custody profile. Okay, if there are no other questions, we will continue our discussion upstairs with uh, Kutis. Let's thank you again.